This is Paul Miller, and I would like to welcome you to the very first episode of Cyberdeck Users Weekly. It's very, it's very exciting to be here. I'm happy to be here, and I hope you're happy to be here as well. I wanted to use this first episode uh, just to kind of put my general framework out there. What, how I'm thinking about technology right now, why I'm thinking about technology, why I'm still interested in it, kind of what I'm looking for out of technology, what I, what I hope is next, what I think might be next, all, all these sorts of things. I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I used a sort of like fictional framework for, for the uh, announcement of Cyberdeck Users Weekly. Most of us haven't built our own cyber decks. Most of us didn't build our own computers. Even if you did build your own computer, like like a or maybe a gaming desktop, uh, you have very little control over those parts, or you maybe had a, a relatively limited selection. Um, you know, you might have an NVIDIA or AMD graphics card, but uh, do you have open source drivers for that graphics card? You know, there's so, so many considerations. So I just my fiction here is let's pretend <laughs> we're a little further down the path and we've got a lot of great stuff and we build our own cyber decks, but we still, um, what do we do about Amazon and Google and Apple and Facebook? Uh, large companies that seem very uh, set on, it's like their business models are based on control. Um, not in like a super insidious way. It's just that if they weren't um, controlling, they wouldn't really have a business. Like YouTube uh, doesn't benefit when I publish something myself. You know, YouTube is not just, is not about publishing video full stop. YouTube is about publishing video on YouTube where they are in charge of it in a sense, you know. Facebook is not about connecting people, full stop. Uh, Facebook is about connecting people via Facebook, where they, in a sense, have control over it. So maybe it's not their motivation isn't control. It's a, it's a, um, it's their their condition for it being a profitable thing for them to do. So like, no, no hard feelings. Uh, it just is what it is. And so the way I've been thinking about technology for a while is that there's something, because I guess for a long time I thought big is inevitable. There's all these economies of scale. The big just get bigger. You know, you're already Google, and then you buy all of Motorola's patents. And then you buy HTC, and, uh, and you're Microsoft, and then you buy Fantastical or whatever, you know. You're a big company and you just get bigger. And it just seems like you keep on getting bigger and bigger. I've also had this thought ever since I was a kid. It's like the, because uh, I was really short when I was a kid. And so I had this mantra, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And this was in hockey. I don't know if that's true. Uh, it seems like it's really good to be big in hockey. <laughs> and you can push it, you know, you can push your weight around. There's a lot of power in there. But the thing that kind of started where I started to realize that there's actually a real weakness in, in big is this idea of distributed systems. So uh, a decentralized system is uh, just a bunch of people doing whatever they want, right? A distributed system is a bunch of people or things with some limited amount of autonomy that are still supposed to reconcile to one central concept one, de one designed result from some sort of command and control structure at the top of the system, right? So these are very, very different things. And I was using the words interchangeably. And once I started thinking of them as separate things, I started realizing the incredible uphill battle and liabilities and difficulties that big companies have as they try to make themselves distributed systems. So I think of this as like, like what 
big is bad at. Um, really, really hard to coordinate a bunch of actors, a bunch of things uh, that have any autonomy at all, right? Um, and still be in charge. So you either you either flex in the direction of giving those individuals and actors more autonomy, which is what I'm going for, right? That, and then you, when you go all the way, when they have full autonomy, it's a, you have a decentralized system, you're not in charge anymore. You don't determine the outcome, um, but the individuals in the system um, can do whatever they want. So I see as a, these big companies grow, there are limitations to what you can perfectly centrally plan um, and so you have to start handing out a little bit of autonomy here and there. Now, I know this is being really abstract, but this, and, 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 and I, haven't re- I haven't written this blog post explicitly because I have a hard time explaining it. And I'm not even sure I'm like 100% right on it. But I have a general distrust of any centralized power, not just because like, ah, they're out to get me, but because I think you end up with like really bad consequences. So I'm just gonna go through some of these big companies, how I would want them to be changed or how I would wanna live in a world where we had something different. Okay, Amazon. Amazon is amazing, what a, what a company, what a company. Um, they are trying to scale, right? Amazon can't literally sell everything ever, right? And they can't invent every product ever. So how do they scale? They have third-party sellers in their ecosystem, right? And then they, those third-party sellers scam the reviews um, in the bad cases, right? They um, ha- have counterfeit products that Amazon can't keep track of. Um, and then also Amazon uses third-party sellers as like free market research. And then Amazon, once they're confident about a market segment, creates a product that clones what the third-party sellers was doing and then use their own like internal um, marketing capabilities to, to win at this market. So Amazon is both um, evil in, in a sense of... Um, or predatory, I don't know. I don't wanna be like too moral here, you know, I'm just trying to explain the system. Amazon uh, needs third-party sellers because it can't do everything. It it couldn't just be one company that makes everything in the world um, and ships everything in the world. It needs these third-party sellers to expand, right? It has to become, in a sense, a distributed system. But its lack of perfect control over those third-party sellers is actually a huge liability for Amazon. Um, And when you think about what Amazon's truly providing when it when with like selling things, it's really a UI. And I think that's what is the case with a lot of these big things. Their infrastructure is uh, feels to me and this might be naive, but possibly secondary. The if, if, if Amazon was only a user interface to find these third-party sellers and p- p- comparison shop between them and find the prices and, and click order and stuff like that, like Amazon has my payment information and my address stored. Um, Amazon, you know, negotiates a deal so that I get consistently cheap shipping rates, you know. Uh, it's mostly a user interface. Now, Amazon has done a ton of infrastructure to serve that user interface, but I'm not positive that it's uh, that that couldn't arise if that if the user interface existed in a more open way. If we had some sort of protocol for Amazonness, where you could shop uh, without one centralized arbiter like Amazon. I'm not sure that infrastructure of the style of Amazon's warehouses wouldn't rise up. Uh, And one of the things I think about a lot living in New York is that I know that there's a lot of little electronic shops around. And I'll sometimes like, I need a very specific cable, right? And I'll call around and see if they have it. 
you know, because I want it that day and Amazon might be a two day delivery for that specific thing. So I think there, we have a lot of, in a, in a sense, redundant infrastructure right now where we have all these warehouses for Amazon shipping things. But then we also have in stock on the shelves items that already exist in stores. So I feel like there's um, maybe a duplication of effort. I just feel like there's something there that uh, Amazon is not, Amazon's not unassailable in selling products. Okay, that's one thought. Um, oh yeah, by the way, Google is actually doing something with like in-store local inventory. Uh, they bought this thing called Pointy in January. Okay, so Google. Google's search is better than DuckDuckGo's search. In a lot of cases, uh, I'm actually finding that because DuckDuckGo, I don't think, is nearly as aggressively censoring search. There are some cases where I'm really, like, I like DuckDuckGo better. And also, I use DuckDuckGo, like, 99% of the time, so I hardly know what Google says about things anymore. Um, Google obviously has a huge advantage in just having the absolute best index of all time of data. But the thing that I think about with Google a lot is that it's a UI. And for the most part, what you type into Google is a website you've already been to. You're typing in the title of a, you're using it as like a command line. You're typing in with good autocomplete. You're typing in the, the, and then it auto completes to the verge. You hit enter, you know, you go because you're not even using the Google search page, right? You're using the, in your address bar. Um, I think a good, very good percentage of Google usage is that UI the, just as a launcher is what, what it would be called. Um, the other thing I know for myself, um, I use search to search the, the very specific. So there's two main resources that I use and a third I try to ignore because it has kind of weird advice for building websites. There's uh, MDN, Mozilla Developer Network. They have almost what seems like the official documentation of CSS and JavaScript and HTML. There's W3 Schools, which has the best SEO and has similar things to MDN, but I prefer the MDN version. So I'd like to actually just have an ignore flag so that when I do these searches, it ignores W3 schools. No offense to W3 schools, I'm just trying to mature my understanding. And then there's, uh, there's this one website, there's one webpage, CSS Tricks Flexbox that has the absolute best guide on how to do Flexbox, which is like a way of doing layout in HTML, CSS. So <laughs> that when I'm doing web development, that's like a good percentage of my time. And then there's obviously stock, stack overflow. And then every once in a while, like I need to expand, like, but, but, but do you know what I mean? Like I am mostly looking for the results inside of those pages and I've already been to those sites. So search within my history, search like uh, a, a locally hosted crawler that crawls my search history. It's not sharing it with the whole world. Uh, so it can have, in a sense, better information about my habits. It will know that I prefer to click on MDN links, so it'll rank those higher, you know, but without having to share uh, or track me. I think lo like uh, th the combination between uh, search as just a launcher and then search of my history it, like there's a, there's actually a browser that does this. I, uh, I'm meaning to look into it more. It's called Men Browser. So between those two things, I feel like that's 90-ish percent or more of what I use search for. So like, and then there should always be a button like expand this to DuckDuckGo or expand this to Google. You know, I really want to search the whole web. But it's really a very small percentage of, I think, the action of what we call search right now. Uh, and so, and it's very, I think it can be very decentralized and I'm very excited about that. Uh, I'm going to speed up on a little bit on this. I think I'm hoping you're getting the vibe of how I'm thinking about these technologies. Seamless. 
there's this tweet going around. It's so depressing of how huge of a cut Seamless takes. And Seamless, I think of it very much like Facebook. I don't know if you're aware of the whole controversy with what, how, how Facebook did the media. But the idea was basically you have a platform. You're like, hey, we have this huge audience that we, you can, you as a business, you're a small business, you want to expand your audience. We have this huge audience. Uh, come to us and build your audience on our platform. And then what you do is you build that p- audience on that platform and they get used to talking to you there. And then Facebook will start charging you to speak to the people who have liked you and followed you and interacted with you on Facebook. And Seamless, I feel like, is similar. I don't know as much about the Seamless business, but it feels a bit ransomy. It feels like they uh, are holding your customers hostage. And, you know, there's obviously been wild things that they've done, like set up fake web pages so that they can get like more commissions and it's all sorts of all sorts of stuff. It, they they end up with a lot of power in the relationship and it seems outsized from what they do. Their user interface for discovering which restaurants are close enough to you to deliver to you and what those restaurants offer. Uh, and reviews. Uh, reviews are a big thing and you know I haven't really brought that up much that's obviously a big thing in Amazon as well. But I think that I think of them as a UI and the, the, the hardest work, the most work that's being done here is obviously the restaurant. Typically the restaurants are doing the delivery. Uh, like I know Uber Eats in a sense has helped restaurants expand uh, the, the quantity of, of restaurants doing delivery has, has expanded. But like Seamless Grubhub in like, New York, like these restaurants would always already deliver and they had that all set up. All that this added is that you didn't have to yell at somebody on the phone. You could just order it, you know, uh, digitally. Sometimes you still have to talk to somebody on the phone to clarify something anyways. I don't think I, it's obviously a very valuable service, but it's mostly UI. And I feel like when it's something is mostly UI, I think it's ripe for disruption. If someone can figure out a a better UI and a, a, a common platform that doesn't charge as much, uh, a, a protocol in a sense for seamlessness, uh, grub hubbiness. So, and so, yeah, that I just mentioned Facebook. Um, I actually have a piece on my uh, blog on pauljmiller.com. I think it's called how to fix the internet. Basically, I think with a lot of content stuff, I think it should be more like WordPress in the sense that I want people to host their own stuff, either on like DigitalOcean or I think eventually it will get to having home servers. That's what I'm something I'm very excited about. Uh, And that's some, those are sorts of technologies I really want to focus on, on this show is uh, sort of self, uh, self-actualizing. I don't know if that's the right word for this, but you know, when you take something that is typically spoon fed to you from the cloud and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to put a box in my closet and I'm going to host it myself and come and come and get it. Uh, I I think it's very empowering at the same time. You know, it's a lot of work. Typically it's uh, sometimes can be a lot more fragile. Like maybe you're not as good at backing things up as Dropbox is, and then you lose some files that would suck. So uh, the, and it's, that's also a UI problem. Uh, a lot of these big companies have spent a lot of time and effort on getting very good at UI because, again, I do think they're mostly UI companies. And uh, most often, the uh, open source alternatives are not nearly as good at usability or looking nice or um, assurances that things won't go wrong. Uh, but that said, it's very exciting because it's very possible. I think there's things like Matrix, uh, which is like federated chat, kind of a end-to-end encrypted version of like IRC or Slack. Um, there's Mastodon, obviously, as like a Twitter replacement, and I'm not sure that that's necessarily the right way. But there's something very empowering and exciting about the like federated communication services stuff like that. There's a Jitsi which is like open source Zoom, and you can just host your own Jitsi server. I really like Jitsi in the sense that 
there's this DigitalOcean Marketplace. Go to DigitalOcean Marketplace, click on the Jitsi server, and boom, you've got a, a Jitsi server. Then you've just fill out a little bit of configuration, like link it up with your domain name, and now you're up and running. Method of deploying software is really interesting and really cool. Uh, I think that will happen both for our home servers, but also increasingly for like in these cloud services. Like uh, I'm hosting uh, my own BTC Pay server. Hopefully, this will be up and running by the time uh, you're hearing this. Uh, the Oh, I think, uh, let me look, let me look what it's called. I think it's Luna Node, BTC Pay. Yeah, Luna Node. So Luna Node uh, is very into helping host BTC Pay. And it's $8.80 a month to host a Bitcoin full node that runs BTC Pay server. And now you can accept Bitcoin payments. That sort of service where like we make it easy to deploy this thing that you still control, I think is really cool. Uh, and I think it's a really great profit incentive to be good at UI. But your profit incentive isn't that you will control the end result, right? You're just trying to grease the skids for someone who wants to control something themselves. I think that's really exciting and I hope to see a lot more of that. So yeah, uh, I put Apple on here because that's one of the bigger I mean, that's probably the company that's largest in people's minds when it comes to technology, typically. It's Apple and Google, mostly. Uh, Apple isn't trying very hard to be a distributed system. And therefore, I think they are less ripe for disruption. There are still a ton of ways I'd like to disrupt Apple. And in fact, one of the ways I've been doing it is in this case of UI. So... I'm working on a, a open source project called Druid, which is a UI library framework type thing in Rust. It's for cross-platform desktop applications. And there's this real weird, I don't know if it's weird, Apple, to make good Apple applications, you're supposed to use Apple's frameworks. To make good Microsoft applications, Microsoft doesn't actually know what you should do. They, they can't <laughs> keep track of what is their blessed framework at any given point. Uh, so I don't know, use Win API, who, who cares? Uh, then there's cross-platform things like Qt or GTK. Um, there's uh, a lot of, obviously, Electron applications are really common. Um, on mobile, React Native is very popular, but still I think that the best breed apps, um, there's also Flutter, uh, uh, best breed apps are typically use, using the blessed framework from, for the respective platform. And so one of the ways I see getting away from Apple, because Apple, in, even though they're not trying to make a distributed system, they still have a lot of control. They can t tell you no, and you can't be on the App Store. They could just delete something off the App Store. Um, I don't think they've really been doing this, but they could delete your phone if they wanted to, you know? And they've been pretty good about standing up uh, and, uh, to the government encryption-wise, but they don't have to, and who would who could stop them if they didn't want to, you know? They, they, they are completely, with, completely within their power to change the rules on you. And, and so I want to get out of that setup. And so I hope that what we'll see soon is something more like Pine Phone or uh, Librem is also making a, a Linux phone. There's also Graphene OS, which is really interesting as an a, a open source, uh, pure open source Android that uh, doesn't track you, doesn't have Google stuff in it. But I think moving more towards full operating systems, I don't think Android is necessarily the foundation of the future, although it's like gotten us this far. I think the true open source operating systems, maybe like Redox OS um, or just a, a mainline Linux distro, which is what like the Pine phone and the Librem phone are running. I forget what the Librem phone's called. And so my only help there is that I feel like we should hopefully have best in breed, best in class UIs. Like when we have these open source operating systems that truly give us agency, I want them to also be better 
not just free in the free beer and free speech sense, but for, like good. And so UI is, is uh, for me, a big draw. And so that's a, an open source project that I've been working on. So right now, obviously, we deploy these Druid apps to Linux, Mac, and um, uh, Windows. But in the future, there's another cool operating system, or, you know, there's just a good version of Linux out there that you want to run the best applications on. And like, I want Druid to be that kind of, that framework that you make the best applications in. And like, if you have to make a Mac app and you can't use Druid, you feel like, oh, I wish I had the great tools and expressiveness and beauty of Druid, you know? That's, that, and, and kind of try to flip the script on like where you find the best UI. Okay, so, those are some, I hope that makes sense as a narrative of what I was just saying. Those are some reasons that I think of, I don't know if you'd call them weaknesses or um, points of attack or th ways I'm thinking about big companies where I feel like they are somewhat ripe for disruption uh, and ways that like we can sort of take back some of the agency of our own lives with technology. So I wanted to just list through some big <laughs> gotchas and problems and hurdles to overcome. One of the big ones is identity. Uh, now, there's the Facebook style of identity where it's trying to be a real ID, like one person, one ID. Um, there's pseudonymity, which I feel like is decreasingly any of the big tech companies seem interested in pseudonymity. Uh, but there are aspects of it like, um, you know, when do you pay for something with your Apple card? Um, as creepy as that sounds, like, oh, Apple knows everything. They've actually worked really hard to, like, make it pretty uh, pseudonymous where you, you, you've got a new um, fake card, not fake, but a new card number per transaction. So it actually makes the harder for the merchants to track you across uh, as a single identity. So that's really cool. Um, so I, I would hope some sort of pseudonymous identity uh, would be good. And one of the reasons why that's very important is for building reputation. Like if you have new user interfaces for Amazon or for Seamless, you know, anything that has reviews on it or where you need to trust somebody, you want to have some sort of trust, a thing to trust, right? Uh, you want to have some sort of stable identity that can build trust over time. And we don't really have that figured out. Microsoft has an interesting system that they're working on, identity. And I don't know if they've like overthought it or underthought it. I don't know. Uh, but I haven't seen, and like, I'm not going to like dive into some like, uh, Ethereum based, you know, or like, um, uh, I forget what that company is called, Blockstack. I don't know. Like, there's a lot of people who tried to make like ICOs off of this concept. And I don't think that's, <laughs> I think what identity will ultimately be is something that's pretty much like a protocol, you know. Uh, all an identity has to be is, is, is the capability to to prove you control the private keys to a public key, the, pri the public key to a set of private, the private key to a set of public keys, something like that. You know, it, it, it can just be a cryptographic thing. And then that's like the protocol. And then we can use it in a bunch of different ways. But so someone could have a stable identity over time and hopefully have multiple of them and that still be uh, good and not gameable. Um, like, cause obviously, you know, a badly, a poorly implemented trust system, like someone make a bunch of sock puppet accounts and then they'd all give you five star reviews and like, you know, now you, you're back to square, square or zero. So it's an unsolved problem. It's very interesting to me. It's very exciting. I hope, and I think that it will unlock a lot of these UI things, uh, these UI disruptions, uh, payments are a big thing uh like i mentioned with amazon you know basically any of these services that store your credit card information have this big leg up i mean really that's one of apple's greatest business strengths is the how many people 
have a stored credit card with Apple. It gives Apple a lot of ability to do things like, hey, let's roll out a service or let's sell some apps and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin is going to fix everything with with money and it's going to be wonderful. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into it because I'm probably get, you're going to get sick of me talking about how Bitcoin is just the best. And, uh, and but it's cool that we have a new money and uh, we uh, have so many ways to use it that we aren't using it yet. So I'm just going to be keeping an eye on that. And there's going to be, uh, I think, inflection points where it's like, ah, that product that didn't work before to be decentralized because of the way credit cards and like fraud and stuff like that work, Bitcoin, you know, or Lightning um, finally made it possible to do it well and safely and effectively. And I think so we could see some big shifts there where maybe they weren't possible before. Uh, I think decentralization of messaging is still kind of not accomplished. I think Signal is wonderful, and I use Signal and I recommend Signal, but it is a single point of failure in the sense that it's a centralized company. And I think messaging, because ultimately I want to get off of phones. Like messaging is just too big for some for one company to do it. Because I want to end the reliance on a phone number as an ID. This gets back to the identity thing too. It's very insecure. Uh, I want to have a um, a text messaging should obviously be end -end encrypted. Phone calls should be end -end encrypted. Signal's doing a great job of that. Um, there's lots of modes of communication we're using, like you know Zoom and Discord and Snapchat and Instagram DMs. You know, I hope there's some unity that happens where, it, you know, those are speaking a common protocol. And again, that's another reason why it can't just be one company. Um, but a common and, and encrypted protocol that is actually decentralized. The other thing I really want to get off of email. I think email is dumb. It, mostly because it, it got kind of ruined by spam. Uh, and there's a lot of things that get ruined by spam and which are a good reason for to, that can hopefully be fixed by some sort of payments. Uh, so I'm excited about possibly Lightning-based messaging. Uh, not not try to extend the Lightning payments protocol for to do messaging, but to do messaging and guard against spam uh, with uh, very small payments or maybe very large payments. Maybe you need to pay me five dollars to to message me. Like, is that so wrong? Like, I'll refund you if I like the message. If not, like. Thanks for uh, paying me five dollars. Uh, I, I, I email is so broken, uh, and I feel a little bad starting email newsletter because I don't subscribe to email newsletters because I I just hate getting email so much. But hopefully, messaging can be solved in decentralized ways. But it's not solved right now, and I think that'll be very interesting and that's something I'm keeping an eye on. Um, another big problem in general with all of uh, trying to solve and improve big tech to make it decentralized people tech is, you know, polish and ease of use. So I already went into that with UI and stuff, but it's interesting in that this has been the known issue with open source software for decades. And it's still, and maybe it's just because it's the lazy critique. You know, obviously there's a lot of bad for pay software, right? Maybe it's just the lazy critique. Like there is a lot of really great, beautiful open source software. So maybe this isn't totally true, but we have to overcome that stigma. And, um, and you know, I'd love it, you know, just like how we, right now we chuckle year of the Linux desktop, um, that, you know, get a real good, good reverse chuckle, like, Oh, haha, ha, there's no good Linux UIs, you know, I don't know, something like that. I don't know. Maybe that now that I say that out loud, it sounds really dumb. So let's not do that. Let's find a better, cooler way of, uh, of ending that narrative. Um, and then the other thing that is something, it's really interesting. 
Linux is famous uh, for uh, as the most like as the foremost usable open source software and foremost used open source software, I would say, other than like things that are also like almost a subset of Linux. The big is I don't know if it's a liability or if it's fundamentally incompatible with open source. What you end up with is a ton of fragmentation. In Linux, there's like seven ways to do everything. You know, uh, I, I don't know, there's some like debate over whatever system D is. Uh, there's GNOME and KDE, there's Wayland and X11. And, you know, obviously with protocols, you have a proliferation of protocols. And then there's, you know, that famous XKCD comic, you know, there's too many competing standards. I know what I'll do. I'll create one standard that unifies them. Like now we have N plus one competing standards. So I don't know if this is solvable because the whole point of decentralization is that people can have the choice and they can make their own choices. So Bitcoin is very interesting and it might be an exception that proves the rule uh, where you have uh, uh, obviously there's a proliferation of options, uh, but is there really like there's Bitcoin and what Bitcoin is, is consensus. So, but you know, without a, um, motivation of being like a world reserve currency, like, is there that sort of motivation to settle on one single, you know, mobile operating system that's open source or one chat protocol that's open source or you know th those sorts of things i hope that there's what what can become big is like it's like a it's a venn diagram and there's a whole bunch of stuff that overlaps on very small minimal the minimum viable protocol for inner communication but i don't know that's it's pretty woo woo uh shaky wishful thinking that that will like really work out and that the minimum protocol will like won't get extended to, to hell like you know the web did uh and and now you know like we have because the web was open protocol that could grow now we have like browsers are so hard to to, to build that microsoft can't build a web browser like microsoft is not a large enough powerful enough technology company to competently fulfill the quote unquote open standard of the web. So there's something to really watch out for there. Um, and so like, but like the whole point of this is to avoid big. So maybe that's good. And, and we'll have just lots of little, instead of having a uniculture of technology, we'll have a lots of tons of subcultures of technology that will interact with each other somewhat in some places, but not in all places at all the time. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I didn't mention this on here, but that's one of the big things that I wonder about. Like, I love Twitter because it's like a one global chat room. That kind of seems to like it only works e either if it was this perfect minimal protocol that everybody spoke or if it's one company. But like, if you look at Mas Mastodon, that's, you know, it's, it's basically a thousand Twitters. Right. And they are somewhat interoperable, but there's a lot of barriers and you kind of almost want that for like moderation purposes. You don't want to let any, everybody in, into your instance. So I think there's a cultural shift that we'd have to be cool with and think about of whether we're fine with being more fragmented as a culture and not having a single global chat room. And so anyways, that, anyway, there's lots of downsides to think about. I'm bullish on decentralization. I think big companies fail for often because of their own evil schemes or, or whatever, uh, and their attempts to become distributed systems and the sort of unmaintainability of a distributed system. So yeah. Uh, oh, I forgot to say this. I don't know where I'll put this. Let's just put this right at the end. Here's how I think about a technology. One, is it actively harming me? Two, if it's not actively harming me, can it be taken away and how easily? 
So those are the things that I want to think about of when I look at a technology, is it good? Is it good for me? Is it good for other people uh, when I use it? And then if I do like it and it is good, who could take it away from me? And how, how easy would it be for them to take it away from me? And if it is easy, then I think I want to start looking for a decentralized alternative. So on that note, uh, thank you for listening to Cyberdeck Users Weekly. I hope to have a whole bunch of funny recurring segments. Uh, I was thinking one thing would be fun is people sent in uh, PRs because, you know, uh, cypherpunks write code. So if you uh, have your first PR or just a PR, uh, like a pull request that you're proud of and you want to tell people about, I think that would be fun as like um, announcement to do uh, just to celebrate with you because that's very important to all of this is that we have to build it. We don't wait for somebody else to build it for us. And uh, I want to do fake ad reads where people just pay me, basically give me a prompt and I'll, I'll make up the ad. So you could be a real company and you could pay me, but you're not, I'm not going to read your ad. I'll make up an ad for your company. So like fake real ads where I still get paid but also don't feel like I'm doing an ad read. So um, let me know how you think about that. Uh, I hopefully by the time that you're listening to this, we'll have a Patreon up. This is actually what I'm hoping to be my income. So I would really appreciate uh, if people signed up for my Patreon. I'm, right now I'm not offering any rewards. If you have a reward that you think would be cool, That'd be great. I don't want to like uh, gate the content in any way, uh, but there's if there's something different or extra I could be doing. Uh, one thing I thought is like I could write you a letter or make a web page for you if you pay me large amounts of money on Patreon or something like that. But for now, I've just got this five dollar tier. I would love for people to sign up for that. That would be really vindicating for me that this I'm on a, I'm on the right track. Obviously. I know it's really tough for a lot of people, so no pressure whatsoever. Um, if $5 is a lot for you right now, please don't uh, support me on Patreon. But if it's not, I would really appreciate it. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna tr I haven't picked which day I'm going to pod, uh, so I'm gonna, but I'm going to try a podcast once a week and, and ship a newsletter with it with some notes. And we'll see how it goes. Let me know. Uh, what you think and uh, how I can improve and uh, and keep keep those cyber decks warm with information all right thank you goodbye <laughs>